High Five Casino lets you play your favorite slot and live table games like blackjack with the chance to redeem for real cash prizes. High Five Casino has a giant selection of over 1,200 games, including hundreds of exclusive games only found on High Five Casino. It's always free to play, and free coins are given out every four hours. Ready to have your own High Five moment? Visit HighFiveCasino.com. That's high, the number five, casino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply. My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. Whether they're tiny amoebas or little green men, aliens never fail to capture our imagination. Now, 77 years after Roswell, aliens are still in our collective psyche. Today, we brought in one of our favorite podcast hosts, Noelle from Creepy Confidential, to help me tell you some tales that will make you wonder, are we really alone in the universe? So get ready, my spooky friends. Today is Alien Takeover Day. Sup, creeps. This is Noelle, the host and resident weirdo Wisconsinite of Creepy Confidential. I open case files on cryptids, cults, conspiracies, and otherworldly creepy. Join me as I open an otherworldly case file on one of the most recognizable silhouettes in the world of ufology. The glasses, the suits, the alien cover-ups, the men in black. June 21st, 1947, approximately 1,400 hours. Tacoma resident Harold Dahl and his son allegedly sighted six flying disks hovering over the Puget Sound near Vashon Maury Island in Washington State. Dahl states that he was patrolling the east bay of the island. He was the captain of the vessel and was steering the boat near the shore of this bay. Also on board are two other crewmen, his 15-year-old son, and his family dog. Dahl looked up from the wheel of the boat to see six donut-shaped aircraft hovering above. The aerial crafts began to spew forth what seemed like thousands of newspapers from somewhere near its center. These newspaper-shaped items were actually a very light-colored metal that was falling to the bay below. According to Dahl, a material that resembled lava rock fell onto their boat, singeing the boy and sadly ending the life of the beloved canine. Dahl claimed that his superior officer, Fred Chrisman, investigated the incident. Dahl also claimed that he was later approached by a man in a dark suit, instructing him not to talk about the event further and attempted to frighten him. This interaction would turn out to be the first documented appearance of what we know now as the Men in Black. Just about all of the Creep Nation, including myself, has seen those catchy Will Smith, Tommy Lee Jones movies about the Men in Black. What would you do if I told you the men in black are real? The black suits, the appearances at the doors of those individuals that have just encountered something otherworldly and unexplainable only to be told by these MIB that they saw nothing or they should never speak of their encounter to anyone ever again. But where did the vision of the men in black come from? Are they real? Better yet, are they human? The very first documented occurrence of the Men in Black was following the Maury Island incident. 
On June 21, 1947, a man from Tacoma, Washington named Harold Dahl brought his son Christopher, along with two workers and his beloved family dog, all aboard his vessel to salvage logs floating on the waters of the Puget Sound. Their vessel, the North Queen, and the passengers traveled a few miles north until they reached the shores of Maury Island. Mr. Dahl alleged that six flying donut-shaped crafts appeared over their heads approximately 100 feet in diameter. All of the crafts were a bright metallic color, and one of them appeared to be malfunctioning because it was flying lower than the other ones in their flight squad. The failing craft began to rain molten lava rock material down to the boat below. Dahl's son's arm was singed, causing an injury bad enough that he had to be taken to the hospital. Unfortunately, the poor pup was so badly burned that it passed away from its injuries that it sustained. I'm sorry to have to tell you what happens to the pup, even if it wasn't a good outcome, because if you're like me, which I have a feeling you are if you're here, I always need to know the fate of the animal. I won't sleep at night until I do. So Dahl discussed this event with his fellow patrolman and supervisor, Fred Christman. They collected some slag-like residue, as well as some samples of this mysterious white metal rock that accompanied the ship that had been seen malfunctioning. The two officers, Captain William L. Davidson and Lieutenant Frank M. Brown, arrived and questioned the two gentlemen and accepted the package of the fragments. In reality, Lieutenant Brown, allegedly, was a counter-espionage agent. One theory exists that while Brown assumed the title of the second lieutenant, but in actuality, he was a much higher ranking suit, receiving orders directly from Mitchell Field in New York and had the authority to assume any rank all the way up to a five-star general if the moment called for it. The two quote-unquote officers collected the story and the evidence, and off they went to the airport. Shockingly, tragedy struck, and the plane crashed, leaving Tacoma under very unusual circumstances. The men were killed. They were gone, and the evidence was gone. Surprise, surprise. The morning after, uh, following the incident, a man dressed in a black suit knocked on Mr. Dahl's door and brought him to breakfast at a local diner in Tacoma. As soon as they sat down to eat, the man in black proceeded to discuss the incident with the man in detail, in a play-by-play, -play, as if he had been there with Dahl down to the minute of detail. This man in black then issued a warning that Dahl better not tell anyone about what he had seen. Dahl was shocked. It was as if he had been there with him. He was speechless. Then, in an odd turn, and according to They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers by Gray Barker, the man in black began to threaten him, saying, quote, What I have said is proof to you that I know a great deal more about this experience of yours than you want to believe. They had witnessed something that they shouldn't have. Turns out this odd course of threatening from this man worked. Following this event, other very famous extraterrestrial events would take place, such as Mount Rainier sighting, the one with the nine flying disks over Mount Rainier, and then the big mammy jammy of them all, Roswell. This short historical era would be called the Summer of Saucers and would influence TV, movies, comic books, and possibly influence people to falsely claim their incidents just for the sake of fame. When all this was happening, Dahl folded and would make a damning statement that what he saw was a hoax. However, consider this. If the guy who claims he saw something then suddenly pivots and says, just kidding, and that he made it all up, should make you question. The FBI agent in charge, Jack Wilcox, recorded on the 16 days that he spent in September of 1947 investigating the case that the hoax was actually what was made up. 
In the FBI documents, Dahl stated, quote, Oh, I stand by what I saw. I saw what I saw. But I'm now going to pretend I'm a liar because that's an easier thing for me to live with than ridicule. End quote. Ultimately, we will never truly know what happened, but this story deserves to be brought back to light. In a redacted document from the same FBI agent, he goes on to tell J. Edgar Hoover, yes, the president, that Dahl did not admit it was a hoax. Quote, Dahl did not admit to, redacted, that his story was a hoax, but only stated this if questioned by authorities he was going to say it was a hoax because he did not want any further trouble over the matter. End quote. Now, Hoover, being the most powerful man in the world during that time, says, quote, this is a hoax. Close the case. End quote. My personal opinion is that this smells like a cover-up. Plain and simple. They redacted who Dahl said it to, that it was a hoax, uh, and Mr. President, with all due respect, someone's cherished family dog died from injuries and the son took fire damage. I do not believe it was a hoax. So now that we know the first time the MIB showed up, that was documented, let's talk a little about how they went mainstream. Before we got our MIB friends in the modern blockbuster film, we had a fantastic book. One of my favorites. This book has been used before for my research here at Creepy Confidential, and I'm sure it won't be the last because it is outstanding. I happen to have a vintage copy, of course. This one is, again, a beloved title. They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers by Gray Barker. He's local to the area that I'm in in Ohio. He's from West Virginia. Chapter 9 is exactly stated Maury Island, which was perfect because there was a whole chapter on it. This chapter is dedicated to the walkthrough of the Maury Island incident and subsequently the man in black uh, trying to intimidate Mr. Dahl into sharing, into not sharing what happened to him. This book has quite a few crucial alien encounters, including starting with the oh-so-famous Flatwoods Monster, and the the back has a large index called uh, Books About Flying Saucers. This book was responsible for the launch of the idea of the Men in Black into the world's mainstream UFO lore. This book also inspired a little show we know as The X-Files. The X-Files also feature these men in black. Within the episodes, um, of course, as Mulder and Scully are investigating cases, they are actually characters that show up. They're not, Mulder and Scully are not men in black. In 1990 and 1991, Lowell Cunningham would launch uh, six issues, three and then three, of a series called Men in Black with Aerosol Comics. This series features the plot of the characters with Zed, J, K, and a neuralizer, but also paranormal cases in the comic books. They silence the poor people affected, though, by lethal force. So there's that. If these characters sound familiar, uh, you would be correct. This comic book is where the 1997 movie got kind of the seeds to grow. The characters and even the neuralizer, however, the not killing humans because they saw an alien part, but that lighthearted change is really what helped people accept the idea of the possible real men in black. After that movie, the MIB were everywhere and have been ever since. People wear costumes on Halloween or even cosplay. We see them when you go down to Mothman, West Virginia, that whole area, because it's just rampant with this idea of aliens, men in black creatures. Um, And not to get too far down the rabbit hole, but if I was the men in black, I would be thrilled about this mainstream idea because no more hiding. They can just move freely about the cabin we call Earth. To leave you creeps today, I give you this little tidbit. Some people that have had interactions with these men in black, and even even in the movie, have something slightly 
different about them. Some of them have something slightly different about them. They still have suits, you know, the glasses, the neuralizer, the hats, but sometimes something that made their appearance kind of slightly off. Skin texture, skin color, or facial features, maybe the way they blink their eyes. There's a chance that these men in black aren't always human. Extraterrestrials showing up as the men in black to cover up extraterrestrial activity. Clever. Summer is supposed to be an opportunity to slow down, but when you look at your kids, you can't help but notice that your kids are growing up fast. Help them build independence as they grow with Greenlight. Greenlight is a debit card and money app for families where parents can keep an eye on kids' money habits while kids learn how to save, invest, and spend wisely. It's the easy, convenient way to raise financially smart kids. Get your first month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash pod. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be to be. High Five Casino lets you play your favorite slot and live table games, like blackjack, with the chance to redeem for real cash prizes. High Five Casino has a giant selection of over 1,200 games, including hundreds of exclusive games only found on High Five Casino. It's always free to play, and free coins are given out every four hours. Ready to have your own High Five moment? Visit HighFiveCasino.com. That's high, the number five, Casino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply. They are the families of the missing in America. And they're desperately searching for answers. Somebody knows something. I'm Josh Bankwitz. Join me for season three of Missing in America. Listen carefully, because just one small detail might allow you to solve a mystery. We have seen miracles happen. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Over 40 years ago, a man named Granger Taylor left a note for his parents saying that he boarded an alien ship, but would be back after he finished traveling the universe. He was never seen again. Was it aliens or was his disappearance something a little more earthly? Granger Orman Taylor was born on October 7, 1948 in Duncan, British Columbia in Canada. His biological father drowned during a vacation at their family cabin when Granger was only a baby. When he was two years old, Granger's mother Grace remarried a widower named Jim Taylor, who had children of his own. Soon, the couple added to their family, and Granger spent his childhood being raised beside his now three biological siblings, three step-siblings, and a half-brother. From very early on, it became clear to Grace and Jim that Granger was special. He was withdrawn and a bit socially awkward, but he showed that he had an extraordinary skill and appetite for anything mechanical. In his early years, Granger spent his childhood alone in his bedroom taking apart things and putting them back together to understand their mechanics. Even though Granger demonstrated to everyone around him that he was extremely bright, he had no interest in formal schooling. He quit school after he completed the eighth grade and started to work as an apprentice auto mechanic for his neighbor. Granger thrived during his apprenticeship and eagerly learned everything he could from his mentor. After one year of this, Granger believed that he learned everything he could in this apprenticeship and he wanted to strike out on his own. His parents allowed him to set up shop on their farm, and he started to build many unique and unconventional things that he would either sell to collectors or to the provincial government for large sums of money. At the age of 14, Granger built a single-cylinder automobile that is currently still on display at the Duncan, B.C. Forest Discovery Center. 
Just three years later, he rebuilt an abandoned bulldozer that the local heavy-duty mechanic said was unsalvageable. By his early 20s, he decided to rebuild an abandoned steam train that he found rusting in the forest. Two years later, he restored it to full working order, and he decided to build tracks for it through his parents' garden to take the local children for free rides. It was very clear to everyone that knew Granger that he found his calling. About six months after Granger moved all the pieces of the train to his parents' property, something quite strange happened. On New Year's Eve in 1969, at about 5 a.m., four nurses were working the night shift at the Cowichan District Hospital near Granger's home, and they saw something strange in the sky. It was a brightly lit flying saucer that was hovering silently just outside the hospital's windows. It was about three stories off the ground, and it just hovered. Doreen Kendall was the first nurse to see this unusual sight, and she claimed that she saw two humanoid pilots standing in this craft's cockpit behind a transparent window. Doreen was joined by several co-workers who watched this UFO hover and then drift off noisily behind a group of trees before it quickly flew away into the night sky. Throughout the night and during the next day, those living in and around Duncan reported seeing that same UFO flying throughout the region. For the months following this, aliens were the talk of the area. Now Granger, he heard all of this talk and soon he caught the same UFO bug that everyone else had. After this event, Granger started to become obsessed with air travel. He earned his pilot's license and began to restore an unworkable World War II Kitty Hawk fighter plane, which he sold to a private collector for $20,000. By the late 1970s, Granger became bored with regular mechanics. He started to think about how he could create the same type of propulsion of a UFO. Now, even to this day, an engine has not been released that can maneuver like the alleged sightings of a UFO, and this excited Granger. He imagined himself building an engine that would allow for an aircraft to move in ways and at speeds that have never been seen before and would take him to places that no human has ever gone before. Granger started by building himself a private office that would be the same size and shape of a UFO. With the help of local children who'd come by to watch him work, Granger was able to scavenge two radio tower satellite dishes from the local dump. He used these to create a cylindrical building by his parents' garden, which he built on stilts. Inside, he put a wood-burning stove to keep warm, a couch, and a TV to watch. He decorated the outside of the building using a lightning bolt design, and inside, he stocked it with science fiction books and books on flying saucers. When the building was complete, Granger would spend hours in there researching and taking notes in his quest to build a UFO-style engine. And this is how Granger spent most of 1979 and 1980, studying and planning until one night Granger was contacted by aliens. According to Robert Keller, who was one of the teenagers that Granger took under his wing, Granger told him that aliens from beyond our solar system reached out to him while he was lying in bed one night. For months before this event, Granger was attempting to contact extraterrestrials with a type of radio that he invented. The aliens introduced themselves to Granger via telepathy, and he thought that the reason they reached out was because he was trying so hard to speak to them. Granger went on to claim that he had several telepathic conversations with these aliens. During these instances, he would ask the extraterrestrials questions like how did their engines work and what was their propulsion source. Now the aliens, they didn't give him the blueprints of their technology, but they did divulge that the secret to their engine's propulsion had to do with magnetism. Now ironically, in the years before this event, Transport Canada created a UFO program in December of 1950. It was formally funded by the Canadian government until mid-1954, and it continued without their funding until 1962. Its name was Project Magnet, and it resulted in the conclusion that UFOs were mostly extraterrestrial in origin and were likely operated by the manipulation of magnetism. 
In October of 1980, Granger joyfully told Robert and another friend, Bob Nelson, that the aliens contacted him again. But this time, they asked him to go on a trip with them through the Milky Way galaxy. Considering that both Robert and Bob already saw their friend as eccentric, they believed that he was likely having some strange dreams or maybe it was something he hallucinated. But at the same time, the two thought that if there was anyone on our planet that the aliens would take with them, it would be Granger. So that's why Robert and Bob asked Granger if they could go too. Granger refused and claimed that they would be leaving too much behind where he wouldn't be. He then told his friends that the aliens were going to pick him up for their trip on a raining night so others would not see their spaceship. But here's the thing, my spooky friends. Granger's friends to this day believe that Granger was completely competent when he said what he did. He didn't demonstrate any symptoms of mental health issues. The only thing that stood out was that Granger loved smoking marijuana. His friends would later say that Granger actually did some of his best thinking when he was under the influence. But Granger didn't just use cannabis. He had also experimented with hallucinogens, like LSD. But there are no reports or evidence available that Granger was addicted or that he was a habitual drug user that would impact his thinking process. Could it be that Granger's conversations with the aliens may have been part of a drug trip? About a month after this, news outlets in British Columbia were putting out stories about what the newspapers were calling the Storm of the Century. That November was considered to be the wettest month in half a century. The area suffered flooding and were at risk of mudslides. Then on November 29, 1980, the town of Duncan got hit with a storm that produced thunder, lightning, torrential pouring rain, and gale force winds. Trees were uprooted and power lines fell, but none of this was going to stop Granger that evening. At about 6 p.m. right before the peak of the storm, Granger went to one of his favorite places, Bob's Grill. He was well known to the staff, and the waitress who served him that night was no different. She would later report that Granger was dressed how he normally did, blue jeans, heavy work boots, and a brown knit sweater. But considering the conditions outside, it stuck out to her that Granger didn't have a coat. It crossed her mind that Granger was not at all prepared for the weather outside, but she didn't worry, since she thought what most people did, that Granger was just a bit quirky. Half an hour later, Granger finished his meal. He paid his bill and went out to his 1972 light blue Datsun truck. That was the last time that anyone saw Granger Taylor. The day after this storm, the residents of Duncan were in cleanup mode. They were clearing roads and residences of debris and fallen trees, and it was at this time that Granger's mom and stepfather realized he wasn't home, and he didn't come home after going to Bob's Grill. Jim Taylor found a note taped to his and his wife's bedroom door. It said, Dear Mother and Father, I have gone away to walk aboard an alien ship, as reoccurring dreams assured a 42-month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe then return. I am leaving behind all my possessions to you, as I will no longer require the use of any. Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. Love, Granger. On the back of this note was a map that was hand-drawn, which many interpreted to be the area of Waterloo Mountain, located about 10 miles or 15 kilometers southwest of his parents' home. Jim and his sons immediately started to search the area. They called local hospitals and the places that Granger would haunt. They drove the local roads and searched the area of Waterloo Mountain to find nothing. No hint to where Granger or his truck went could be found. Jim and Granger's mom, Grace, decided to look at Granger's will, just like Granger asked them to in the note. This is when they discovered that the will was changed. In this will, where the word deceased was written, Granger replaced that word with departed. Time started to pass with no clues of what possibly could have happened to Granger. Days turned into months and months turned into years. When the date of Granger's return came on June 29, 1980, his mother and stepfather kept their back door unlocked, hoping that Granger would come home. On that same day, his stepbrother Douglas, who worked for the Canadian Coast Guard at that time, 
sat out for most of the night on deck of his patrol boat, searching the sky and hoping that Granger would come home. He never did. The Taylor family still kept hoping that someday they would get a clue of what happened to their beloved Granger. Then six years after Granger disappeared in April of 1996, municipal work crews discovered an artificial crater that was approximately 600 feet or 182.9 meters off Mount Provost Road. It appeared to be created by some sort of blast and going cross country, this blast site was not too far from the Taylor farm. Scattered through this crater was rusted and discolored fragments that appeared to be from a truck. They then found vehicle parts throughout the area and shrapnel embedded into the trees. The workers called the Royal Canadian Mounted Police who started to investigate. Within the debris field, the police found vehicle parts that still displayed their vehicle identification number. The police were able to confirm that the VIN number matched the number of Granger's truck. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police then brought in police cadaver dogs to search the area. They found remains of fractured human bones, with the largest being a humerus from a left arm. They also found clothing remains and sadly, Granger's mom Grace was able to confirm that those bits of clothing were consistent with a shirt that she had made for her son. Many who knew Granger, as well as the police and some family members, believes that the remains that were discovered belonged to Granger. Due to DNA profiling was only starting at this time, it was not available to the police for this case. This is why no DNA profile was completed on the remains, and it was never able to be confirmed that Granger had actually passed away. Even so, the police closed the case on Granger's disappearance and declared him deceased, with his cause of death being labeled as undetermined. This was because that if the remains did belong to Granger, there was no way he died in a natural way, and there's no proof that his death was a homicide. In addition to this, it is hard to believe that Granger decided to end his own life. After all, when individuals plan their end, it's extremely abnormal for them to blow themselves up, and specifically, creating a blast of that magnitude. Granger did not have a history of depression or suicidal thoughts. Even the note that Granger left does not lead one to think that he was planning to end his own life. Now, concerning what could have caused that explosion, Jim Taylor reported that a significant amount of dynamite disappeared from his farm the same time that Granger disappeared. The Taylor family were licensed to use and store explosives on their property. It was being used to clear stumps on their land, and Granger was extremely familiar and competent concerning the use and the engineering behind explosive demolition. That is why so many people have a hard time to believe that Granger would choose this method to end his own life. So, what really happened to Granger Taylor? In the wake of the crater discovery, many different theories started to circulate on what could have happened to Granger on that cold and rainy night. The first of these is that on the night he disappeared, Granger had loaded his truck full of dynamite, drove to the location of the blast site, and deliberately ended his own life. Some have speculated that Granger became frustrated and depressed when he couldn't solve the mystery of UFO propulsion, and he was unable to cope with this failure. So, he concocted the tale of him taking an interstellar voyage to ease the pain for his loved ones that he left behind. But to those who were close to Granger, this theory makes no sense at all. They claim there were no signs of depression or frustration, nevertheless suicidal ideation. So that brings up our second theory, that Granger blew himself and his truck up by accident. Some believe that Granger decided to bring the dynamite with him that night as a way to try to signal the aliens where he was, or to somehow help facilitate his journey to outer space. As he did, the explosives detonated early, taking Granger's life. So, how would this be possible? Dynamite is made of nitroglycerin, sorbents to absorb or adsorb liquids or gases, and stabilizers. The maximum shelf life of a nitroglycerin-based dynamite is one year from the date of manufacturer under ideal storage conditions. But regardless of the sorbent used, Eventually, sticks of dynamite will start to weep nitroglycerin, which can pool in the area where the dynamite is stored. 
This will cause crystals to form on the outside of the sticks, resulting in them becoming even more sensitive to movement or temperature. And when I say sensitive, I mean if the material is even slightly jarred, the chemicals inside become unstable. This can lead to it detonating. In addition to this, dynamite that gets wet can cause the nitroglycerin to leak further. Could it be that Granger took older dynamite that exceeded its shelf life and it weeped into its container? Could the heavy rains of that month made that dynamite wet and cause the nitroglycerin to leak further? Then, on that very damp and raining night, the dynamite was jarred, which would cause it to ignite? Well, then there's another theory, that Granger Taylor had an undiagnosed and untreated mental health condition. As we mentioned earlier, Granger told his friends that he was being communicated with telepathically. But was it aliens? There are many reasons why a person can have the perception or sensation of hearing voices while awake when there's no one around. Some of these include former traumatic incidents causing a dissociative disorder, a result of an assault or abuse, a lack of sleep, or side effects from some medications. It also can happen with the use of some street drugs, when mourning somebody that you love, or it can be part of being in a dream state. But it also can occur when a person is suffering from schizophrenia. Considering Granger's case, what if Granger started to show symptoms of schizophrenia and the aliens he was speaking to was all in his head? This is something that we'll never know for sure, but if this is true, Granger's use of cannabis and hallucinogens did not help. Schizophrenia is a very complicated condition that involves many different factors like genetics, viruses, and chemical imbalances in the brain. But scientists are currently studying the role of drug use in patients with schizophrenia, and the results so far are quite interesting. In one study, it discovered that cannabis is one of the most commonly abused substances amongst individuals suffering from this condition. The one thing that both this disorder and cannabis has in common is psychosis. Studies have shown that when people use cannabis, they can have psychotic symptoms, and if you suffer from schizophrenia, this only gets worse. In fact, if you carry specific genes that affect brain chemistry, cannabis will only raise the chance that you will get this disorder. It also can cause schizophrenia to start much earlier than if there were no cannabis use. The same can be said for the hallucinogens that Granger's friends have said that he also used. LSD-induced hallucinations resemble the type of hallucinations experienced by schizophrenic patients. They also can cause panic, extreme anxiety, and drug-induced psychosis. But without a body to test, we will never know for sure if this is what was happening to Granger. But lastly, there is the theory that many who knew Granger hopes to be correct. That Granger Taylor was picked up by extraterrestrials on that dark and stormy night. Many hope that he's living his best life on an alien ship flying around outer space and learning from these evolved beings. Some believe that this couldn't possibly be true since Granger's date that he said he was going to return has long passed. But, you know my spooky friends, that may not be entirely true. According to Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, time is relative. For example, if a car is traveling at 60 miles an hour or 97 kilometers an hour, it will appear to a stationary observer to be going 120 miles an hour or 193 kilometers an hour by a driver going the opposite direction at the same speed. But this also impacts time. Depending on the observer's relative position within a gravitational field, that observer would experience time passing at a different rate than another observer. This is called time dilation, which is the slowing of time perceived by one observer dependent on their motion or position in a gravitational field. So for example, if you would travel on a spaceship at 95% the speed of light to go to a planet that is 9.5 light years away, that trip would take 10 years to a person on Earth. But to the crew on that ship, it would only take 3.12 years. So in other words, the 42 months that Granger said he'd be gone would actually be a lot longer for us on Earth than it was for Granger. Perhaps someday Granger will return from his voyage around the universe to find a very different world from the one he left. Thank you all for joining me for our collaboration episode with one of our favorite shows, 
Creepy Confidential. You can find both Horrifying History or Creepy Confidential on any major podcast provider. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for our podcast. For when you do, not only do you let more people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our regular episodes, as well as any bonus episodes that we release. After all, my spooky friends, Halloween season is almost here, and we have several bonus episodes planned to celebrate the spooky season. If you want to get even more horrifying history, you really should check out our website. When there, you will find the links to all of our social media and to our YouTube channel that not just has our podcast episodes, but additional history videos for you to enjoy. We also have a blog that's filled with spooky topics to read up on, and on top of this, this site is the home to our fan club, which has great tiers and spooky perks like your own feed to listen to our show ad-free. It is also the home tour store that is filled with great merch that you guys are going to love. And for our fan club members, you will get a permanent discount in our store for the entire time that you're a fan club member. You can find all of this and more at horrifying-history-shop.forthwall.com. Thank you all for listening today, and until next time... High Five Casino lets you play your favorite slot and live table games, like Blackjack, with the chance to redeem for real cash prizes. High Five Casino has a giant selection of over 1,200 games, including hundreds of exclusive games only found on High Five Casino. It's always free to play, and free coins are given out every four hours. Ready to have your own High Five moment? Visit HighFiveCasino.com. That's High, the number five, Casino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply. They are the families of the missing in America. And they're desperately searching for answers. Somebody knows something. I'm Josh Bankins. Join me for season three of Missing in America. Listen carefully, because just one small detail might allow you to solve a mystery. We have seen miracles happen. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, it's Michelle Beadle. That's right, the Michelle Beadle. You're welcome. You love talking about sports. I love talking about sports. You know the only thing cooler than talking about sports? Sports! And right now, all your favorite sports are on Sirius XM. I'm talking every NFL game, every game from the NBA, NHL, MLB, every NASCAR race, golf major, major conference college sports, and all the top games in the WNBA. If it gets your heart pumping, it's on Sirius XM. So start your free, free, free trial of Sirius XM today. Visit SiriusXM.com slash believe.